<coughs> My uh, presentation this afternoon will take a little longer than three quarters of an hour. The slack uh, uh, will be uh, the following one. That will be Tom Sabos. I start with something which changes the pace a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about the basis in directly. In other words, I will try to put it in the context of the present crisis and the relevance of the gold and silver base bases um, in relation to the present crisis. So you might say the title is Silver and Gold Bases with respect to the um, depression of 2008. I have been saying that for years now, at least eight years, that those who are shorting the dollar, the US dollar, uh, and US bonds are gambling. It's very dangerous, in my opinion, and events have borne me out. Rumors about the imminent demise of the dollar and the bond market are grossly exaggerated. Bear in mind not only that the casino owner, in this case, rigs the odds, your odds as a gambler at the gaming tables, but he also rigs the value of the chips. <laughs> so it's double <laughs> exposure to risks. So the issue is greatly confused by this double exposure to risk. The teetering of the dollar at the 80 level, I'm referring to the dollar index, and this has been the refrain which you heard before the crisis, that once the dollar drops below the 80 level, then the game is over. It's, it's going to collapse. This was the message. And uh, I objected to this, to this, I was saying, if the dollar drops below 80, so what? It will continue its decline it, as it has below 80, but there is no guarantee that it will not bounce back above 80. And uh, I think right now it's about 86. Eight. So we have visited the, the low 70s, and we are back now the high high 80s. <coughs> so this is like a bear trap, the dollar and the 80 mark. A lot of analysts predicted that if the dollar violates that support level, then it's bound to go into a free fall. Nobody is seriously considering the possibility that this chart point, like everything else about the dollar, is rigged. If the trip, it's a, really a trip wire. It's set up to trip the bears. The demise of the U.S. long bond market has been talked about for years. Analysts were so busy in writing the post-mortem that they, have no, they had no time to look at the charts. Yet the charts clearly showed that the price of the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond is in an upward channel which hasn't been violated for the past 28 years. And this in spite of the dollar moving downwards in a downward channel. 
where it has been for 35 years. Now how is it that nobody sees a contradiction here that cries out for explanation? Nobody else sees the hand of the master rigger setting up the trip wire. Here's a question for the discriminating observer. How is it that interest rate derivatives do not obey the law of supply and demand? The more there are of them, of interest rate derivatives, the more they are in demand. Half a quadrillion was the beginning point, uh, say, three, four years ago, half a, sorry, half a quadrillion, that's 500 trillion before the crisis. That was what they talked about, the so-called notional amount of the derivatives market. And compare this with the annual GNP, Gross National Product of the U.S., which is only 13 trillion, so half a quadrillion, 500 trillion, as compared with 13 trillion. And the world output was not greater than 40 trillion. So we were talking about this derivatives market, which was more than 10 times the size of the world's, uh, the value of the world's production of goods and services. Huge, huge discrepancy. And not only that, but this derivatives market was increasing at an annual rate of about 40 percent, which meant that its size was doubling every other year. So by now, because these figures were pre-crisis figures, by now we have over one quadrillion size of derivatives market. So how can you explain this in terms of supply and demand? Well, everything in human experience will tell you that such a thing is not possible. The more of anything exists, the less it will be appreciated. The quantity of a security increases exponentially, if it does increase exponentially, that its value is bound to decrease exponentially for the stronger reason. Yet here we are, derivatives doubling in quantity every other year and far from losing value, they are ever more in demand. Why? Now here's the explanation. The reason is because derivatives are tickets to a risk-free profit. And as such, they are the straw on which the world's banking system swims or sinks. Swims as long as interest rates are falling, sinks as soon as they start rising in earnest. And in this case, just the threat of interest rate rising was Im important enough to break the back of the camel. Enormous fortunes have been made on the long side of the bond market by the bulls during the past 28 years. Remember in, 19, in the early 1980s, 1980s uh, mainly attributed to Paul Volcker, the, uh, after the interest rates shot up to a level of 16%, they started falling, but falling interest rate meant rising bond values. 
So those who were bullish on bonds, and in 1980 it wasn't an easy thing to do to be bullish on the bond, because again everybody expected the dollar to collapse in short order. But those who were bullish, and they went long on the U.S. bonds, they have made a fortune. Now, I count among these people the Chinese. Make no mistake about it, the two trillion dollars worth of foreign exchange reserves is not all trade surplus of the Chinese. So much of it is the wages of adroit gambling on the long side of the bond market for the past 28 years. And that's what in, in the morning I was referring to as my, the cause of my suspicion that there is a conspiracy. The, the uh, U.S. government is, is uh, bribing the Chinese to continue buying those bonds, and they do. And in doing so, they make uh, huge profits. So that is far more important than the trade surplus, which is there, but they, they are taking a loss on them. And this is compensated by uh, the uh, profits on the uh, bond porf portfolio. <coughs> In 1982 or thereabouts, the Chinese were astute enough to realize that the U.S. 30-year Treasury bond yielding 16 percent was a fantastic bargain. Not only did they lock in an income at 16 percent for 30 years, but they held out for a, they held out a promise for capital gains by doubling in value at least twice as interest rates fell from 16 to 8 percent and then from 8 to 4 percent. The Chinese are not as naive as suggested by the analyst. They wrote the book on irredeemable paper currency. When the pale face treasurers in the West were still experimenting with alchemy, diluting silver and gold coins in circulation for the benefit of this sovereign old copper nose. Figuratively, we think about Henry VIII, who was nicknamed the Old Copper Nose because he put a wash on copper coins, and as the wash was wearing off, his uh, the the uh, nose of his effigy showed the copper underneath. So Old Copper Nose <laughs> was using alchemy, while the Chinese invented paper without which. Ben Bernanke could not do his air drops of Federal Reserve notes. We just have to thank the paper to the Chinese. The invention of paper and paper money uh, in China uh, centuries ago. <clears throat> Now, the Chinese have the power, through their continued buying of the U.S. loan bonds, to drive interest rates further down, all the way to the Japanese interest rate levels, chalking up fabulous capital gains on their bond portfolio in the process. I would consider that most analysts just ignore this. They are not looking at, at this capital gains aspect of the Chinese uh, support of the U.S. dollar. More importantly, they can do it even in the face of continuing erosion of the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. The bond market today is immensely different from that of the 1980s. Not only have T-bonds been created through the fast breeders 
Bond gambling has been further escalated through the creation of interest rate derivatives. In 1980s, uh, there was just a, a, a very small uh, interest rate derivatives market, basically uh, consisting of bond futures. Now, a new generation of derivatives is invented every few months. The first generation was the bond futures, as I mentioned. Then the second generation options on bond futures. And then all these created more risks, and more risk had to be hedged, and they were hedged by the creation of a further round of interest rate derivatives. And this, there's no end to it, because as even without increasing the bond market, the size of the bond market, the hedging of the risks were compounded. And as I say, it, it only ta took a few months before they realized the need for a new round of, of uh, derivatives. And it gave them fancy names, such as such as uh, default, default, default swaps. Yeah, the, <laughs> but there were many others, many, many, many. other names. <laughs> so there's never enough of those derivatives because new ri risks crop up with the rise of every new generation of hedges. Academic economists see them in an admirably, see them as ad admirable, sophisticated instrument. Pity our forefathers, they had to do without them. <laughs> Financial journalists want to stay blissfully ignorant of the fact that derivatives have put the law of supply and demand into abeyance. See no evil, hear no evil. Cocaine is here. Perpetual motion has been invented. Enjoy it. Don't ask questions. Sit down, sit down, sit down. You are rocking the boat. That was the attitude. And serious questions were not asked. As I have said, the more of those derivatives have been created, the more were demanded, because they are considered a ticket to riskless profits. The bond speculators come in, they realize that the, these risks have to be hedged, so they take a long position at every level. So they are in Japan, so they are in the United States. When the casino owner sells tickets to riskless gains, the law of supply and demand is suspended. Both supply and demand tends to become infinite. Just ask Charles Ponzi, he has been there. Interest rate derivatives are proxy for bonds. They are new chips that you can use at the casino. The, they augment a supply the size of which already boggles the mind. On that count alone, bond prices should be approaching zero, and interest rates should be approaching infinity. Instead, what did we see? Bond prices were still marching upwards. A conundrum indeed, if there ever was one. I call it a con 
conundrum. C O N con conundrum. Those who still believe in the dictum of 19th century textbooks on bonds that it takes higher interest rates and lower bond prices to perk up excitement in the lethargic bond market are victims of the most brilliant confidence trick of all times. The gambling spirit in the 21st century is or has been mul multiplied not by higher interest rates but by the issuing by issuing bonds with ever lower coupons that means issuing ever more tickets to risk free profits ever more derivatives on those bonds and interest rate derivatives those who still think that it is necessary to bribe foreign suckers to buy more U.S. bonds by the stratagem of printing ever higher coupon rates on them are hopelessly antediluvian. They have never heard of the miracle of creating capital gains through pushing interest rates ever lower. Analysts failed to see the real purpose of the derivatives monster. It has been sprung on the world in order to keep bond values up and going higher so that the game of musical chairs could go on indefinitely. But what about the US dollar index? Allegedly showing that foreigners are getting tired of the infinite supply of US dollars of diminishing value that keep coming at them. It is nibbling at the, at, at the time before the crisis. It was nibbling at the all time low of 80. I mentioned this before. Which, if taken out, if that support is taken out, you may never hear the dollar to hit bottom. Analysts were telling you that you cannot fool Mother Nature. A dollar's value is closing in on its intrinsic value, which is zero. Don't buy that, I said at the time, and I, I'm sorry that I just have to say, I have told you so. The dollar did fall through 80, it did visit the low 70s, but it's now back again. The dollar index, just like the CPI number, the consumer price index, is manipulated in order to fool the uninitiated. Should the dollar fall and approach 70 as it did, foreign central banks did go and see to it that their paper was also falling. So eventually the game of catch-up uh, worked and the dollar re-established its previous index. Not through appreciation or increasing purchasing power, but through other currencies playing catch-up. And this is the pattern for the future also. We can see that happening again. Of course, the dollar will weaken, uh, and then it might fall through again the 80, and then this will be repeated. Obviously, the volatility is also going to be on the increase, so don't take it for granted that the volatility, we have seen the volatility played out. It's not the end. Volatility will keep increasing. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk about the central bank's bag of tricks. 
There is no way to predict the future scientifically. That's my starting point. So, my, I'm, I, I would be a fool if I tried that myself. I'm simply saying that the dollar collapse is extremely unlikely at this juncture. I'm inclined to lay far greater store about or by the chart showing the US long bond in a 28 year uptrend, this channel. And this has not been violated. I know that the dollar, the yen, the euro are all being manipulated lower, each by its own issuer. Why the name of the game is all fall down, isn't it? But fall they must at a controlled pace and central banks have a bag of tricks to make sure that the depreciation is not getting out of hands. Ultimately it will, but for the time being I just don't see this. The dollar is falling but all the other currencies are falling so you have a relative sense of security and the attention is, the focus is directed away from the fact that all currencies are falling. It's the rate of the fall which is different from one to the other. So central banks have a bag of tricks, which is very deep. Furthermore, the central banks of the world have all the marbles. They take, they make most of it. So you want to win by placing a wager against the dollar, good luck to you, but your odds are infinitesimally small. So my earlier statement that the US interest rates are likely to fall more replicating that of the Japanese, violating the support at 80, doesn't change anything on that fact. The world is not now at this crucial turning point, and it hasn't been for the past 28 years. Uh, when the Kondratyev long wave cycle switched from rising to falling mode. Now those of you who have read about the Kondratyev cycle, they know that this is a long wave cycle, could be as long as 50 or 60 or, or even 70 years, and the crucial point where the mode changed from rising to falling was in the early 1980s. Ever since, it's in a falling mode. Now we are at 2008. The question is, where are we in terms of the Kondratyev cycle? The answer is, we are in a trough. the interest rates are still falling and firms are losing market share, pricing power, stockpilers of commodities, ever more owners to carry. All this add up to a falling price level which previously was in disguise and now it's quite in the open. Uh, the dollar index, forget it. It's for the birds. I, I, uh, personally, I don't consider the dollar index a, a very meaningful indicator because it is, it is uh, manipulated, like a lot of other indicators. So that's the reason I am so stubborn in, stink, in sticking to a deflationary scenario. Here's my reasoning. Hyperinflation almost engulfed the world in the 1980s. 
when in a spectacular coup interest rates were allowed to go to heights unheard of at 20 plus percent by the maverick chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker. Virtually all banks of the world became insolvent as a result of the value of their dollar assets being wiped out by the high interest rate regime. But the banks were saved in the 1980s. It was a miracle. What saved them? Well, what saved them was that interest rates peaked at that high level and then it started this descent, which is still continuing. And the banks are suffering also in that falling interest rate environment. So you might even say the banks were bailed out unexpectedly by this change from rising interest rates to falling one. <clears throat> it is ridiculous to suggest that Volcker gave us a strong dollar in 1980, which would be a repeatable feat. That, uh, the second coming of Paul Volcker would save the world, save the system. <clears throat> luckily for Volcker, he was gambling, and luckily for him, the gamble worked. Before the bluff could be called, the falling interest rate structure started fueling bullish bond speculation in the bond market. But this bluff which Volcker played in the 19, early 1980s is non-repeatable. In 1982 the world was riding high on the Kondratiev long wave. 25, 28 years later, in 2008, it is languishing in the depths of a trough. Helicopter Ben, Ben, ben Bernanke, could not take his foot off the throttle. If he did, all deflationary hell would break loose, and he knows it. The debt pyramid would collapse in a fashion more spectacular than that of the World Trade Center. Now, where does the basis come in? I was talking about various indicators such as the dollar index, in, and I would even include the gold price among these indicators, which are all manipulated. In other words, they do not carry a real, a true message. They are designed to mislead people. So, uh, you, and, and interest rates also. I mean, this is all uh, fool's paradise to think that lower falling interest rates are good for you, they are good for the economy. These are manipulated uh, indicators and it would be a grave mistake to follow them when you are trying to provide for your financial future. And it is my message to you that there is still one indicator which cannot be falsified, the one indicator which you can ex accept at face value, one indicator that will not lie, and that is the basis. And the reason that this indicator is speaking the truth is precisely because it tells you about the source of supply of more monetary metal to the market. And that's what we discussed, we talked about in the morning, that a fall of the basis indicates the drying up of the supply 
of monetary metal coming to the market. And this is, cannot be falsified, because if somebody wants to falsify it, he would have to supply cash gold and cash silver, not paper gold and paper silver, to the market. That would be the only way of falsifying it. But if you did that, then you wouldn't falsify, because then there would be actual physical gold and physical silver coming to the market. So I would suggest that the basis is really the key indicator to follow and to study. I'm not, and I don't think Tom or anybody else here is tr uh, trying to suggest that we know everything about the basis. We are just students of the basis. We are trying to approach it in a scientific way, trying to uh, forget about the political implication and uh, economic and other implications, just look at it from the strictly scientific point of view and, and um, analyze it and study it. And this study is quite overdue. We can look around and find that practically nobody is doing it, certainly not academia, certainly not media, the financial press. They don't even know in many cases what the basis is. Uh, I wanted to take a survey how many gold mining executives are familiar with the concept. But I was frustrated because they were not, they did not come to our Dallas meeting. I was hoping for a much better representation. But uh, whatever little surveying I did, I found that perhaps one in ten gold mining executives were familiar with the concept. So they had some ideas what it was, but only one in a hundred would uh, consider using it in in uh, marketing their product gold, which shows the level of ignorance at those whose main business it is to market gold. <coughs> How could central banks work the miracle of making interest rates fall in the face of running the printing presses over time? This was a question earlier in the morning and keep interest rates from rising again. That's just the best part of it. Central banks have let the genie of the derivatives monster out of the bottle. The genie is mushrooming over the world economy, growing at a clip of 40% per annum. It is presently at the level of one quadrillion dollar, maybe more. Some estimates put it higher. But let's just say with one quadrillion dollars. This is one thousand trillion dollars. Doubling in size every second year. It is the derivative monster that keeps interest rates low and makes them fall further. And, and an open question, I don't have the answer. Has the present crisis started exploding, or annihilating this derivatives monster? There are signs that perhaps it did, because all the banks which were part of it, the banks did not make up 100% of the derivatives market, but they made up a large percentage. And then there were insurance companies like I, AIG. AIG and, and many others. So some of the, them are out, uh, perhaps most of them are out of the game. Yet the collapse of the derivatives market hasn't been confirmed. So we don't know where we are. The, those who have more information will not uh, share it with us. And I, I am vacillating between two uh, 
views. On one day, I think, well, this is it. The derivatives monster has started collapsing. It's going to be finished as a matter of months, or at least at most one year. But next day, I think that the derivatives monster is still very much with us. <laughs> because the speculators have been making money. And they are still continuing making money because the interest rate structure is still falling. So I uh, don't ask the question, what about the derivatives market? <laughs> I had to schedule a sixth session for Gold Standard University Live. It's an add-on which we plan, I already told you in the morning, we plan to have in Hungary in March and the title is the vaporization of the derivatives market. But this, I hope in the intervening months, this question will be clarified. Right now, I cannot make a firm uh, assessment of this, where we stand in this game. Obviously, the end is coming somewhere. We might be already be, this might be already the beginning of the end, where we are right now. But I cannot confirm that. So we'll wait and see. Of course, we know how the central banks are behaving and what they are trying to achieve. The It may appear that the central banks have all the marbles. As indeed, they do, except for one marble, and that is the gold marble. They don't have that. And therefore, they are powerless to falsify the basis. That's, that's my axiom in this. They, they have all the marbles. They can control and, and uh, rig and falsify everything. But the gold marble, which means cash gold, not paper gold, that's a very sh has to be a very sharp division between the cash gold market and the paper gold market. The gold marble, they haven't got. <clears throat> the only wager against the dollar that has a chance of winning in the long run is one staked out by the gold marble. Ironically, it is also the simplest. And anybody can play it, even people of modest means. That wager consists in a scaled-down purchases of physical gold. It's a very simple strategy. In, in a way, it's the simplest strategy you can think of. You keep accumulating gold. You, you, you have an income and every day you pay, every payday you would be in the position to buy a, a quantity, maybe a diminishing quantity of gold, but it would add to your uh, your hoard of gold. The refinement which I am and we are suggesting here is that don't buy gold indiscriminately. You have to think of timing as a crucial part of it. I already hinted at this in the morning and I'm repeating it. The basis is the indicator which gives you the clue whether the timing to buy is good or it's advisable to postpone uh, the purchase to the next payday when it may be better. Except that there is a danger because we know that the long-term tendency for the basis is falling and ultimately it will fall 
to the extent that uh, gold goes to backwardation, and I might say the same for silver. And we will talk about this later, which is going to happen first. The silver backwardation permanent. Per this is not a temporary dip. We are talking about reaching the point where silver is no longer available to the market or gold is no longer available. So this point is coming and remember this would, this is a treacherous thing because the falling of the basis could be misinterpreted at that stage, at that final stage as a good point uh, and and you just have to be careful in interpreting the signal and this is what we are trying to do to give you the background for this so the strategy is keep buying never selling and uh, therefore uh, Therefore, th this is a strategy available for people of, of uh, modest means as well. Also, keep in mind that you want to have fully paid gold. You are not financing gold purchases with bank loans or any other loans. And why do I say that? Because the uh, people who are still in debt uh, will be squeezed by the falling interest rate structure. So the, the, the field is very treacherous. You have to move, it's touch and go. You have to move very carefully. Hmm. Well, I'm uh, probably, I uh, will not use the full hour, but I, I, uh, I uh, We'll finish my exposition and Questions. open the question period with, with, with one thought. The music stops when the basis turns permanently negative, heralding the curtain on the last contango in Washington. It tells you and tells the world that all offers to sell physical silver and physical gold have been withdrawn in the markets. The monetary metals are no longer for sale at any price. The game of musical chairs is up. Fear not, your gold marble has reserved a chair for you in this game of musical chairs. If personal misfortune overtakes before that happens, you still won't sell. In an utmost emergency, you borrow against your gold. And I say utmost, I mean, we can suffer uh, all kinds of adversities, including health problems or accident or whatever it is, you don't sell because this is like insurance. You don't insure your property to lift uh, off the insurance. You are not selling your lifesaver on a boat which is facing sinking. You keep on. And the same applies to your gold ball. You have a ball, maybe a small one, but it's a gold ball and you hang on. Remember, interest rates are kept at an artificial low level by the managers of the con conundrum, which is a free gift. So, as I say, in an utmost emergency, you can take advantage of this gift and keep your insurance intact. So with this I finish and uh, let's have a discussion. I'm ready for your questions. Yes? Uh, professor, um, 
strategy that we just outlined <coughs> is to use the basis to help guide the timing of your purchases in the real goal of your work. Uh, and those purchases are to accumulate uh, a form of true wealth that is never sold. Um, how does one cash in that insurance if you need it? Or, or, or do you see a time when that insurance is going to be utilized for your survival? I mean, how do you translate your store of gold into putting a roof over your head or, or food on the table? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but he's asked, I think he's, a, he's asking the question of if the strategy is to buy and hold, Mm. All right. At certain propitious times, there's better times according to the basis to buy than others. But you follow this strategy, and you accumulate. And and your intention is not to sell. All right, but to always hold. When do you cash in, or how do you uh, how? And if you're in an emergency, how do you utilize that store? I yeah. think you all talked about it by Barbara, but I think his feeling is, is that if you're always holding, if you're always buying, how do you, when do you liquidate? That's right. That's right. Your kids are going to be real lucky. <laughs> <laughs> They'll sell it right real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but if you teach them never to sell. <laughs> That's right. yeah. the, 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 question, the question is justified because it looks insane to keep accumulating something without any plan how to utilize uh, it and uh, and the answer to that is that uh, certainly you won't uh, liquidate as long as you get paper for gold because gold is gold and paper is paper so you are the name of the game for the time being is to switch out of paper into gold and any switching out of gold should be conditional upon a sound monetary system. If the leaders of the world ever see the light that it is in the interest of human society to put an end to this disastrous experiment with irredeemable currency. There's no two ways about it. Now, of course, we are running too far into the future. We have so many unknowns that it's not possible to uh, give any precise instructions what to do in this case or that case. But when time comes, you have to be aware that the authorities will pretend that we have solved the problem, it has been repaired, and now you are ready again, so let's have a free gold market, uh, whatever. And then you might be tempted to say, all right, I t take the word of the central bank or the government or what have you. Be very cautious and you, you have to double check or even triple check the validity because this is, they are going to uh, try to uh, to uh, persuade you to relinquish your gold uh, under false pretenses. In other words, they promise you this and that and that, and if you do give up gold uh, for a for a, a, a profit, just for the sake of argument, suppose the government will say. Uh, this Christmas, coming Christmas season that sure we admit that there were mistakes and we fixed the gold price at five thousand dollars so announce <laughs> <laughs> so you know it sounds very tempting it does. because because you say gee yeah, that's fantastic yeah. I have made this tremendous <laughs> profit so I, I have to cash in I cannot miss this and the government may even say but you have to do the conversion within a 10 day period if you don't well too bad you missed the boat so there will be tremendous pressure on people to cash in so you have to be very careful um, uh, there's very little I can add to this because you cannot give any guidelines that what would be a proof that the government is acting in good faith. I, I, 
you know. Now, one thing which you might find uh, the kind of protection is you have to check out whether if you give up gold will you have a convincing mechanism whereby if you change your mind later then you can get back your gold. So what I'm saying is that any kind of acceptable monetary reform at the minimum has to include a constitutional guarantee that the mint, the government mint, is open to gold and silver. And that means that you can take your raw gold or could be uh, scrap gold or silver plate or whatever form you take your gold to the mint. And the mint will give you ounce for ounce coins, gold coins or silver coins back. And they don't charge for the coining of gold and silver. They may charge for the assaying which is involved. But let's just assume that you take the quality of gold which is required and the quantity and then the exchange is f no charge. The government will not charge you for coining. This is known as free and unlimited coinage at the mint. And I, a, sh a shorter phrase would be the government is opening its mint to gold and silver. And you check it out. How valid is this commitment? And obviously a c country which has uh, uh, has tricked people into surrendering their gold earlier would have a very questionable credibility in this regard. But it could be that, uh, that the government, uh, some governments, uh, will make that commitment in good faith. I've heard so much, uh, this is my first visit to Australia, I heard so much about the Perth <laughs> That's right. That it's a government mint which you can trust. <laughs> <laughs> and and I I was even saying, okay, let me check it out. And I didn't find anything false until they said, we are out of gold, we are out of silver. Well, how can they? I mean, if they had a credible commitment to the people, other than to some abstract. Uh, uh, theory of Keynes and Friedman, then they would would be would be able to find a way to to coax the gold and silver out of hiding, and then there would be a constant flow. But they are not saying that. They say we sell you, and and if we run out of inventory, too bad. That's it. So I I'm sorry to say. I, at this point, I do not trust the Perth men. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> okay, more questions. Yeah. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. Excuse me, you've said that the, <coughs> the currencies are competitively devaluing, and I think we have evidence for that. Well, what are they devaluing against? They aren't devaluating against gold and silver in the last few months. So isn't, aren't they devaluating in terms of purchasing price? And isn't that inflation? He's, he's, he's talking about, the you mentioned the devaluation of currencies. Sorry, and that they're... Competitive. Sure. No one ever here. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, he asked about the devaluation of currencies. The competitive. The competitive, that competitive. they're all going against each other. And he said, but what are they, what are they devaluing against? If, if they're all going down, what are... And he said, well, if they're losing purchasing power, isn't that... The same thing is saying in another way, it's inflationary. So that, that's your question? That's his question. Um, um, you see, what we face here is, I guess, you're talking about the, the dollar index, which has turned around and from a weak dollar, we are going into strong. Is, is no, that? Not particularly. If, if all the currencies are devaluating against each other, what are they actually devaluing against outside of the monetary system? 
they aren't devaluating against gold and silver because the prices of gold and silver have come down. No, this is agreed. Price. This is agreed. Well, how can they all devalue simultaneously? Again, measured against what? No, no, it's never simultaneous. You say competitive devaluation. It means, let's take two, the euro and the dollar, U.S. dollar. So first, the uh, dollar falls. And then there is pressure on the European Central Bank to dilute the euro. For, they would give you various reasons that we have to protect our export industry and this and that and that and we can't live with a strong dollar, so, uh, a weak dollar, so they devalue. Now, they devalue on, to the point that the dollar looks strong again. Remember, it started out as weak relative to the euro. Now it's strong again. So then there is an argument that it's too strong. We can't live with that. So we have to push it further down. So that's what's happening. And you are right, the measure is monetary metals to, to measure that thing. So the, uh, the interesting thing is that while this g goes on, and w at one point the dollar looks strong, at another point the euro looks strong, the fact is that they are both losing purchasing power. And that's the litmus test. Isn't that inflation? It's, well, it, uh, sure. If inflation is just a word. I think it's overused, and uh, to be precise, I tend to avoid the word, the word inflation. But I, I can't argue with that. You, you, what you have is inflation. They are uh, actually uh, the, 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 uh, what you have to see is it's a manipulation of interest rates more than uh, more than uh, the uh, straightforward on a on a on a masked pumping of money they know that people are watching watching them pump out more more money so they try to take other routes and I would say a, a, a better measure might be the effect on the rate of interest, which is still falling. Interest on loan bonds. Yeah. Does this more or less answer that? Yes. yes. Thank it's you. Yes. Um, professor, um, under a sound money system, uh, if it arrives, there'll need to be a way of um, coaxing uh, all the gold into circulation where it can be socially useful provide a sound money system people can trust. Um, is, is trading the basis the method by which people can earn a constant income by providing that service to the whole of the economy, releasing their gold into circulation and, and, uh, and earn a constant income from that service they're providing to their economy? Is that the... He's, uh, trust, I mean, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe he's asking the question of, um, we, ha we we're looking at monetary reform, possibly, yes. possibly, all right, and and where gold performs a function in society, all right, and um, by trading the basis, by buying, you know, by going in and out of gold, would that perform that function in society, a sound money function, just by trading the basis? Is that it? Just because just if that? I've got, if I've got lots of gold, I just hang on to it. What's the incentive for me to put it into circulation so that it becomes? A currency, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering if trading the basis is the method for giving the gold hoarder the incentive to dishoard uh, into circulation. Uh, that, that's that's <laughs> we haven't heard that one yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe maybe uh, maybe one way to think about it is that you know under a gold standard, putting you know putting gold into circulation, one way to do it would be to lend gold uh, at interest. Uh, currently, of course, you know, you, that's not a concept that anyone thinks about, but it is actually integral to the basis. Um, but it, you wouldn't think about it as a basis. Under gold standard, the basis really doesn't exist. There's nothing to compare the basis to because really it, interest takes the four, you know, interest really becomes this time component. Uh, it replaces the basis, as it were. 
so that in fact what you'd be doing I guess as you know if you have gold and uh, you wanted to increase your wealth as it were um, you would lend that gold at, at, a, at a rate of interest and you'd get more gold back because interest would of course be paid in, in gold um, so I don't know if that answers the question but I think it it may not it, it Maybe the basis doesn't really exist in under the gold standard. I, I like, um, sorry, let's stay with this question a little longer. I like very much what Tom is saying. And we come back to this when we discuss arbitrage between gold and silver. Because, because the basis is a concept very close to the concept of interest rate in an honest monetary system, which we don't have. So interest here is just a false card on the part of the government, on the part of the central bank, but under an honest-to-goodness monetary system, there is such a thing as an honest interest rate. And the two concepts are very close. And, and we are going to discuss that uh, as much as we can in future uh, sessions while we are together here. So we don't go into that, but I, I like that and I am recommending to you what Tom has just been saying, that well, this is not the same as interest, but the two concepts are akin. There is a, a close relationship between the two. Yes. Professor, uh, looking at the interest rates, I, I understand that it's becoming well understood throughout the world, at least through John Williams, that interest, the real interest rate, after taking into account the purchasing power question, is, is actually much higher than the notional interest rate. In fact, that it, it's negative. It's uh, seriously negative, maybe as much as 10% negative. And, and under those circumstances, is it possible that the market would set a higher interest rate than the casino operators, as you call it? Um. Again, well, we're, getting, we're getting intense here. Good question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that uh, he's he's raising the issue though. Uh, John Williams of Shadow Stats um, put about about the that that they have uh, a, we have interest rates, but it's not the real interest rate. Like a CPI is not really a real CPI. Um, so they're we, false cards. Yeah, so they're false cards. Okay. So he's saying um, if if it, if it is a false card. And we are running a real economy with a false card. Is it not possible that somehow the real economy is going to arbitrage the false card ultimately? Yeah. That's <laughs> so. He's saying if 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 they are if they're manipulating the interest rates, if they're manipulating it and they're they're out of whack, they're just doing what they're doing, and they're really and our economy is really running on another interest rate. That's there's an actual rate going. All right. Is it possible that that the actuality of the interest rate would affect the nota the false interest rates? Would it would it overpower the ability of the government at some point to well, it, impose? Yeah, it's more direct than that. Isn't it? The market could say that the interest rate, the real interest rate, is much higher than the than the official interest rate, and therefore the bond price, the bonds are overpriced. Um, Personally, I don't like the concept of a real interest rate. It's it's a fuzzy concept because you say, well, you have to be able to measure what inflation is, and then you have to subtract or add or whatever. But you see, the, the, this is just the problem: how to measure inflation, and therefore I, I. Also, it, it looks to me as an effort to doctor something which cannot be doctored. This patient is dead. If you try to give him medicine and try to improve this or look at, or, or, well, you make make a mummy out of it, but you cannot make it walk. <laughs> and and uh, so, I. Personally, you won't find the phrase real interest rate in my writings. I consciously avoid that. 
and I try to make my uh, concepts independent of this. I, I know this is not what others are doing and I wish them good luck if they can explain the real world in, uh, in introducing the real interest and the interplay between uh, faked interest, real interest, this and that. You may get somewhere. I'm not trying. I'm, I'm keeping away. Other way with green. Okay, I want to interest you. He said real interest rates are higher. They're not higher, they're lower. Yeah. Real interest rates are lower yeah. than nominal interest because rates. Of is is it, the the is depreciation of the money has been subtracted. I think it's being misunderstood what, what uh, is the opposite of yeah. real interest rates. I, from my reading of this question, I felt that he was saying that the reported interest rates are lower than what should interest rates should be. That John Williams is reporting should be. Should be. Well, I think maybe one, one aspect of this is that... As opposed to uh, notional interest rates minus the CPI. I mean, the interest rates are what they are. Maybe the, the, maybe the way to rephrase this is that interest rates are not high enough to keep purchasing power so at that's, parity. That's what I think that and so the interest rates really would need to be much higher in order for someone to truly earn a, retur a real return. So oh, talking about a real return. But, or even stand still. But I think maybe that gets back to the capital dis destruction yeah, that, that the professor was talking about earlier. Remember we'll earlier today, he was saying okay. that yeah. really we'll these lower interest rates cost, cost, are okay. destroying okay. the capital yeah. base of yeah. the U.S. and the world economy. So and that's what the whole deflationary argument. So I think you're approaching exactly the same thing. That in fact, by having these low interest rates, which are artificially low, they are destroying the capital base of the banking and monetary system. And David also mentioned something about the possibility of arbitrage on that, where you can borrow at the lower interest rate and somehow issue out loans at the higher interest rate, which the economy might accept. Which I, I, I heard that, but I didn't agree with it. Well, actually, the professor said yeah. arbitrage the false card, right. which yeah. I think yeah. is a bit different. Yeah. yeah, we'll take, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, President, with regard to tracking the basics, just comparing the, we're talking about it in US dollars, of course, trading basis. He's talking about trading the basis uh, in US dollars. Is, it, is that your assumption? Does that have to do with. Uh, what happens with regard to the timing of the trading basis when you're trading another currency? Yeah. You, in order to be able to talk about basis, you need a futures. Market. So whatever currency is, uh, it would be the U.S. dollar in this case. Now, assuming, assuming that this market loses all its credibility, I'm sure other countries will be interested in taking over. And, uh, candidates could be Switzerland or Japan, or, and and then of course it would be a different currency. But uh, just talking about timing, we go to the. Uh, for example, the Australian dollar lost 30% in the last two months. So, look at the timing of buying gold. Well, he's starting, for example, the Australian dollar has lost 30% in the last two months. So, in buying, in terms of buying gold, how, would, does that affect his trading the basis? Yes. Because he's got a currency fluctuation. Yes. So, he's not only dealing with the U.S. dollar, he's dealing with his own US currency. Dollar, yeah. Yeah. Dollar, US, yeah, Australian dollars. Does that affect how you would trade the basis? Right? Would you say this is. A, a new approach, or this is a hybrid, or it's just it can be reduced back to the dollar. I don't. I don't know. Well, no. it's consistent. <laughs> the answer, that's what that's the same. The I haven't given any. I think you'd want to do the. Yeah, I think you'd want to do the initial, yeah. the trading itself with U.S. dollars. I maybe the decision as to when you might switch in out of US, the Australian dollars into U.S. dollars to buy gold or silver may be a separate decision. Uh, but it may be something that if you studied or kind of studied that there may be a relationship there that could be, you know, taken advantage of. But it's not something I've looked at personally. It's like whenever we read out here, we read a lot of newsletters from the U.S. Most of the time I've got to invert whatever they say is a good idea. Right, sure. But forever I'm saying, well, they've yeah. said do this. Well, I'll do the opposite. Right. Because one of the dollars, yeah. been, there's a tremendous fluctuation in the currencies. Yeah. And it's impossible to follow American yeah. ideas. Straight out across, out yeah, out of yeah. the gate. Yeah. It's a two-step process. We'll be back in um, 15 minutes, and then uh, Mr. Tom Zabo.
Is that he'll take the uh, next leg of this, the next, the next and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you.